Hello everyone. Uh, today is about uh, the theme of Indian history part 3, uh, chapter 1, colonialism and the countryside exploring the official archives, right? So about this lesson is uh, nothing but the colonial rule in India as well as the uh, situation of the cities in, I mean in the subcontinent uh, during the British rule, right? So in this chapter we are going to discuss about the zamindas. Okay, you know very well about the zamindas and the traders, merchants, and money lenders, and the royals. Everybody uh, that you have already studied in grade seven and eight. So in this lesson we are going to study about the zamindas of Bengal and uh, I mean uh, then after that the about the people those who were lived in the Rajmahal hills, right? So Rajmahal hills is located in Jharkhand and the people of uh, Paharias and Santals they were living in Raj Mahal lives. Then after that the introduction of East India Company initially we are not going to discuss anything about its introduction however after the introduction we are going to discuss what are the changes the East India Company did in the Indian subcontinent. So before that I am going to discuss you that introduction of East India Company. You know that in East India Company, English East India Company was introduced in India in 1600 by uh, in English people uh, by English people and uh, after that it was at that time uh, the Mughal Empire I mean the last Mughal Empire our ship was uh, ruling in India the time uh, who came to India uh, is nothing but in 1608 captain uh, William Hawkins who came to India for accessing the trade to their country but here uh, deliberately uh, Aurangzeb refused to give a permission but uh, indirectly they started their process for uh, trading to their England and other European countries right so after the introduction actually uh, initially the East India Company came to India for only the trade purpose but after that uh, they th want to make uh, many changes in their land as well as uh, they want to get all the produced materials from the farmers as well as that they thought of giving uh, loans to the uh, farmers that's what whatever they produced in their culti I mean whatever they cultivate in their lands everything they could get in a cheap price right so uh, this is their uh, aim to introduce East India Company but after that they came to know that uh, the Indian rulers are uh, politically not strong as well as they are decreasing their power so they uh, took advantage on their political power and they started to rule both politically and financially in India so however it is finally they introduced their East India Company with a political rule uh, in uh, River Bank of uh, Hooghly in Bengal uh, after that they did many changes in the city of Bengal then from Bengal they had a headquarters and from there they started uh, to uh, rule everywhere in the subcontinent right so that's what they about the East India Company and about the Raj countryside established its Raj so established its Raj is nothing but the land revenues and uh, other things and uh, here we said uh, we're going to we are uh, seeing that the revenue policies and other things right then after that the laws introduced by the state yes the many laws i mean like uh, permanent settlement and uh, mahalwari settlement riots and uh, zamindari system so these are the new laws has been introduced by the british rule for the good as well as uh, perfect uh, administration but these are the things uh, made many problems uh, be between them and uh, finally they suffered a lots and lots like a great famine in 1770 uh, in Bengal so that uh, the 10 million of people were dead of the great famine and the people or I mean the farm peasants I mean, poor peasants or cannot pay their uh, taxes so uh, regularly which means you know that sometimes the crops used to grow nicely and uh, sometimes it failed to grow it depend on the climatical condition so that the people are not in the position to pay regularly in the fixed uh, taxes and everything so these are the things made a uh, big problems among the zamindas and the local uh, rajas and uh, mughals ev everybody's right then after that the revenue records and the surveys and the journal accounts by surveys travelers report produced by incurring the commissions so after that many travelers previously we have discussed that many travelers have been visited india like ibn Batuta and uh, albany and uh, francis so uh, what Frenchman Francis Bernier and etc. So these are the people these peoples were left their accounts and the surveys travelers etc. So everything has been uh, collected by the collectorate of the every each districts and uh, from them uh, the people started to know about the past things right. So in this main thing is about the land system in India as well as the 
what land system in india and the settlements uh, permanent settlements and the taxes were implemented to the peasants and the people i mean uh, raja started uh, uh, auctioning their land for uh, lease to the zamindars from zamindars the local peasants uh, used to purchase the land uh, not purchase uh, for lease they will take as a rent and uh, from them they want to pay the rent to the zamindars from zamindars to rajas right so these are the things we are going to discuss in this chapter so first one is bengal and the zamindar so previously we know that uh, east india company was established in a bengal uh, river bank of hooghly so that the bengal was the, their headquarters uh, so river bank of uh, hooghly is located uh, you know hooghly is in bengal and the bengal and the zamindars so as you know that colonial rule was first established in bengal no doubt colonial rule was first established in bengal and it is here that the earliest attempts were made to record the uh, rulers societies and established a new regime of land rights and the new revenue system let us see what happened in the bengal in the early years of the company eic is the east india company rule so you know that what was their main reason to came to india is the, the actually the east india company's the main reason to came to india is for a trading purpose but initially they came to know that there were not much uh, ruler as well as uh, not strong ruler in india as well as they are very poor in their administration and everything so they started to establish their uh, company with uh, both politically and financially so the main i mean the main aim of introducing the east india company in india is nothing but they wanted to change something in their uh, regime is you know that uh, power okay something in their power as well as they want to change the land rights as well as the new revenue system to the indian peasants so uh, what are the causes i mean what are the impact of these new revenue systems made in india that all we are going to discuss in this chapter right so the first one is an auction in bodwan so you know that what is the auction uh, auction in bodwan bodwan is the one of the city which is located present in west bengal right so in 1797 there was an auction in bodwan present day in bardhaman so the actually the city is located in west bengal but the bodwan was renamed as bodhaman in the present days it was a big public event a number of mahals held by the held by the rajas of bodwan uh, were being sold so it was a public action uh, many rajas as well as zamindars used to participate in the action so what they will sell in the action is nothing but the people i mean uh, especially uh, the rajas right especially the rajas and the kings whoever is uh, uh, holding the land they are going to auction it in a public place so the permanent settlement had come to come into the operation in 1793 so you know don permanent settlement had introduced in india in 1793 the east india company had fixed the revenue that each zamindar had to pay so previously as i told you that it was an a public event where the auction will be held so that time the rajas whoever is uh, holding their land they used to auction their land for a, a huge profit i mean uh, for a huge money so these man, these uh, lands are going to purchase by these zamindars so however it is yeah, that they are going to purchase but they are not the owner of the land but they have to pay the tax to whom to the rajas as well as the east india company so here the east india company uh, is responsible to collect the taxes uh, under the zamindars right so the permanent settlement was introduced in india uh, in 1793 after that the east india company introduced a fixed revenue on the each land so the aim of the land is that zamindars had to pay tax to the company then the estates of those who failed to pay were be auctioned to recover the revenue so the estate whoever is a uh, owning if they fail to pay i mean if the zamindars are fail to pay the tax to the company the land will be seized and find, uh, and then it will be auctioned again to recover the revenue since the raja had accumulated huge arrears his uh, his estates had been to put up for auction so since uh, many uh, demand i mean uh, many monies or want many revenues or wanted to come so that's what if anybody didn't pay their taxes na immediately they will seize the land and they immediately in the very next day they will auction the land for some other zamindars numerous purchases came to the numerous purchases came to the auction and the estates were sold in the highest bidders bidders is the uh, auctioneer who is asking uh, lands no auctioneer 
But the collector soon discovered a strange twist on the tale. Many of the purchasers turned out the servants and the agents of the Rajas who had brought the lands in the behalf of their master. So here uh, you know that a number of actioners as well as the number of numerous purchasers used to come for uh, getting the land, actioning the land. But here one deliberate thing has happened is that many zamidas are used to uh, close with the servants of Rajas as well as the agents through the brokers. You know? Through the agents, they uh, will get their land with a low cost of uh, profit. But in this, out of 90, 100, 90% of the sale at the auction was fictitious. So, which means 90% of the sale won't be happened in the uh, auction, because, which means these all 90% of the lands already uh, booked by the agents as well as the servants of. Uh, uh, half those who were uh, connection with the Zamidas, right? So remaining 5% only will be get by other Zamidas and other big uh, purchaser. So the Rajas estate had been publicly sold but they remained in the control of his Zamidar, right? So the Rajas estates were being sold in the were being sale, sold in the market but these lands will be under the control of Zamindar, right? These land will be under the control of Zamindar which means the Zamindars wanted to pay tax to the Rajas. So in this chapter, why some people are failed to uh, pay their revenue and uh, who were the actioners and uh, why, what will happen in the rural areas of uh, Eastern India at the time, uh, what is the story about this land revenue and uh, purchasing the land action and everything that we are going to discuss in the upcoming topics, right? So next one is the problem of unpaid revenue. So as I told you that if any Zamidas fail to pay the tax to the Rajas, the land will be seized at the, I mean the very next day itself, the land will be auctioned in the market for next Zamidas. No? So what are the problems that happened for unpaid revenue? Okay, unpaid revenue, no? if anybody didn't pay the revenue, what will happen? That is going to that or we are going to discuss in this topic. The estates of the Bodwan Raj were not only the ones sold during the closely years in the 18th century, over 70% of the Samidas changed hands after the permanent settlement. So as I told you that in 1793 permanent settlement was introduced by the company and after the permanent settlement 70% of the Samidas has started to uh, hand off hands after the permanent changed hands which means uh, transferring the land to one to another which means they could not pay the tax regularly right so uh, in introducing the permanent settlement british official hoped to resolve the problems they had been facing since the conquest of bengal so after the since the conquest of bengal the company is uh, facing the problems of uh, financial as well as the land problem so one they thought that once we introduce the permanent settlement every problem will be solved so we people uh, could get a uh, sufficient financial uh, facilities due to by actioning the land but that is a uh, totally wrong by 1770, the rural economy in Bengal was a crisis. The recurrent, the recurrent, recurrent famines in the declining agricultural input. So, in the introduction itself, as I told you that the problem of uh, permanent settlement, what, what was the impact of the permanent settlement, is nothing but around 1770s there was a great uh, economic, uh, economic uh, crisis in uh, Bengal. So, 10 million people were dead due to the great famine, right? So officials felt the agriculture trade of the revenue sources of the states could could all be developed by encouraging the investment of the agriculture and this is done by securing the rights of property and uh, property and permanently fixing the rates of the revenue demand. So after the great famine in Bengal at 1770, 10 million people were dead, right? So after that, many officials, I mean the court uh, officers, officials and the agricultural and the revenue officers are thought that if we develop, I mean if we put more investment on the land, on agriculture, so once the crop good, it, once the crop uh, gives it's a good harvest, then we people could earn a plenty of money as well as if we fix the permanently, permanent tax on the land, then it will be sufficient to all as well as it will be a great financial help to the company. So these are the suggest, uh, these are the ideas were suggested by whom? The company officials as well as the uh, agricultural officers and etc. If the revenue demand of the state was permanently fixed, the company could look to forward the regular flow of revenue which enter while enterprises co entrepreneurs could feel sure of earning a profit from their investment since the state were not uh, chiffon off by increasing the climb. 
So after that, the main important thing is that if the company fixed the permanent settlement, right? If the company fixed the permanent settlement on the lands, then the company could uh, get a regular income, right? Could get a regular income, whether uh, the zamindars or the riots, whether they could uh, harvest or not. They, whether they will take a harvest or not, that's their problem. But regularly, company wanted to get a revenue, so that was their main uh, aim to establish this uh, permanent settlement. So that even the entrepreneurs, entrepreneurs, as I told you know, the land were selling in the auction. So whoever is purchasing the land, they will uh, put uh, their profit on their land. From them, they used to uh, lease their land to the local uh, poor peasants. So from them, they will collect the taxes no so whoever i mean the entrepreneurs could uh, feel that they will because they are going to invest their money on their la purchasing their land so they people also will earn money as well as uh, the company also will earn money regularly this process officials hoped would lead the emergence of the class of yeoman farmers and the rich landowners land landowners who would have the capital and enterprise to improve agriculture so especially if the company introduced a permanent settlement the lands will be purchased like a yeoman farmer and the land on a uh, big landowners and other enterprise owners and everybody because they have a plenty of money so i think they have uh, good money and uh, every Thing, so they will improve their agriculture and other things. Nurtured by the British, this class would also be a loyal to the company. So this class, I mean uh, the big landowners and the yeoman farmers, everybody will be loyal to the company and they won't cheat the company for paying the revenue and etc. which was hoped by the British East India Company. The problem, however, lay in identifying the individual who could both improve the agricultural and the contra contract to pay fixed contract to pay the fixed revenue to the state so after the introduction of the after the introduction of the permanent settlement it was one of the way to identify the individual who could have more money as well as who could improve the agricultural uh, as well as who had uh, wealth to contact with the company for the revenue of the state after a prolonged debate uh, amongst the company officials the permanent settlements was made with the rajas and uh, dalukdas of bengal no down uh, company finally after the many discussion with the many uh, company officials the permanent settlement was uh, made with rajas and dalukdas of bengal they were now classified as a zamindas right so they were now classified as a zamindas they had to pay uh, the revenue demand uh, that was uh, fixed in uh, perpetuity uh, and uh, the terms of this uh, definition the zamindas was not a landowner in the village but the revenue collector of the state. So as I told you that these lands are sold to the zamindas, from zamindas to local peasants on riots. From them they will get a land, I mean they will get a taxes and from them uh, East India Company will get a taxes, right? So uh, zamindas had several uh, villages under them. In company calculation, the village within one zamindar, form, one zamindar formed one revenue estate. So many villages came under the control of the Samindas who had a permission to uh, collect the taxes even though they are the owning their land and who put uh, plenty of money on purchasing the land but however it is they are not uh, owners of the land but they had rights to collect the taxes from the people as well as they are the tax collectors right. So. According to the East India's company's calculation, if more than, I mean, East Zamindas, sometimes the Zamindas had access to rural 400 villages, right? Not everybody, one or two had access to access 400 village under their control for collecting the taxes. The company fixed the total demand over the entire state whose revenue the Zamindar contracted to pay. So every year the company uh, will fix the total demand over the entire year and from them for uh, periodically the company will collect the taxes from the Zamindas. The Zamindar collected, Zamindar collected rent from the different villages, paid the revenue to the company and retained the dif uh, difference, difference as his income. So as I told you that even uh, who is collecting the revenue, Zamindar also collecting the revenue. So Zamindar also needs some uh, servants, no. So he had to pay salary to the servant. So once he collected the revenue, I mean Zamindar collected the revenues from all the villages then he will settle, I mean he will pay the tax to the company, the rest of the monies will be taken as his salary as well as uh, he want to give the salary to his employees, right? Soldiers, no. So the everything, I mean the remaining money will be retained by the zamindas as their income. 
he was expected to pay the company regularly failing which his estate could be auctioned so the main rule was put by the company on zamindars is nothing but they want to pay regularly to the company if they fail to pay the tax to company the land will be auctioned and the very next day it will be auctioned to uh, some other zamindar right so next thing is uh, why zamindars defaulted on payment so here the question is why zamindars uh, failed to pay the taxes to the uh, company right so in the beginning i mean after the introduction of the east india company the company officials thought that uh, the revenue demand i mean the fixed revenue demand will give uh, zamindars a sense of security as well as the company officials uh, motivated the zamindars to get their investment which they put on their land zone right so after that however it is it everything became uh, failed which means after the introduction of his uh, permanent settlement zamindars regularly failed to pay the revenue demand and unpaid balances accumulated so what was the reason and why did they fail to pay the revenue to the company so here there are four reasons why they failed to pay the taxes regularly right how many reason four reason the first reason is the initial demands were very high so you know that when they were uh, auctioning their land the initial demand was very high so according to that it's like a tender okay so according to the uh, initial amount these zamindars had to get i mean these zamindars had to fix the uh, revenue system to the peasants on the royots okay so the thing is the initial demand was very high so how in which basis the company fixed the initial demand is nothing but so company had uh, uh, company had put their view only on the profit manner which means if the crops gives uh, uh, nice cro nice crops and the nice harvest in the year so the uh, zamindars as well as the peasants will gain lots and lots but the company never as their share so that initially if we put uh, uh, i mean a high demand on their land and uh, even company also will get a regular revenues and everything but in other way they didn't see the failing their crops right so arguing that the burden on zamindars would gradually decline the agriculture production expand the prices rose so if the prices increase right if the prices increase the uh, peasants as well as the zamindars will get money so they will they could pay regularly to the company but if the crops fail to uh, give its a harvest so in how they will pay the money to the company so that was the first reason and the first reason was initial demand was very high then the next thing is was the crops failed to grow in 1790 right crops failed to grow in 1790s when the prices of agriculture produce were depressed making it dif uh, difficult to royards to pay their due to the zamindar so here royards is nothing but under the zamindars who were uh, cultivating the lands right so in 1790s the agricultural products okay agricultural produce become uh, depressed and uh, it all the crops were uh, failed so what happened here the royards are not supposed to pay their uh, tax to the zamindars so without collecting the money how zamindars could pay to the company anyway so that was the second reason they didn't pay the tax then the third one is the revenue was invariable and regardless of the harvest and had to be paid regularly so revenue was invariable whether the crops failed or cr crops harvested nicely that doesn't matter but regularly the people wanted to pay tax to the company so that what he is telling about the sunset law if payment did not come in by sunset of the specified date the zamindari was liable to be auctioned yes so this is known as sunset law so what is sunset law sunset law is nothing but if the payment if i mean if the zamindar did not pay the tax before the sun set the land as well as the zamindari will be liable to be auctioned right i mean the lands will be seized and it will be auctioned to some other zamindar then the fourth one is the permanent settlements initially limited power of the zamindar to collect the rent from the royards and manage his zamindari so the company provided only limited power to zamindar to pro to get the taxes from the people as well as to manage his zamindari like uh, paying tax pay, paying salary to his uh, soldiers and everybody so these are the four main reasons why they failed to pay uh, taxes to the company 
regularly, right? So next one is um, the company had recognized the zamindars as uh, important, but they wanted to control it, so regulate uh, them, subdue their authority, and restrict their autonomy. Uh, the zamindars troops were di disbanded, customs duties abolished, and their kacheris, kacheris courts uh, brought under the supervision of uh, collector appointed by the company. So after that, there was a big changes which made by the company to the zamindars is nothing but previously we uh, discussed that each and every zamindars is uh, owning uh, for minimum for 300 or 400 villages under their control and to the villages they are the responsible to collect their taxes. So one person cannot collect the taxes for all the villages so they have their soldiers and everybody right so the after the big changes made by the company uh, to the zamindars is nothing but they abolished i mean disbanded the troops soldiers of the zamindars and the custom duties of the zamindars were being abolished so instead they appointed the collectors for the each districts by the company so collectors will be supervised the uh, zamindars for collecting the taxes zamindars lost their power to organize the local justice and the local police over time, the collectorate emerged as an alternative center of authority. So here, Zamindos lost their power as well as they doesn't have any power to organize the local justice and the local police. So here, uh, once they appointed the collector for all the districts to supervi supervise the Zamindos, so here collectors emerged as an alternative center for authority. Severally restricting what, what the Zamindos could do in one case, when the Raja failed to pay the revenue, the company officials speedily dispatched the Zamindar with explicit instruction to take charge of the district and to use the most effectual meaning to destroy all the influence and the authority of the Raja and his officer. So here the thing is the collector is resp responsible for everything as well as he was uh, uh, I mean supervising the Zamindar. If any Rajas or any Zamindars fail to pay the taxes to the company, immediately the troops of the collector will uh, seize all the lands of the Zamindar and they will destroy all the things uh, as well as the authorities of the Zamindars as soon as immediately they will seize the lands of the Zamindar. So here the collector had a much power than Zamindar. At the time of uh, rent collection, an officer of the Zamindar usually the Amla. So after that, Amla is nothing but the court official, court, uh, just officer of the court, that's it. Uh, in any way, during the collection time, he doesn't have any power to collect, just he is an officer of the court, right? Yes, came around to the village, but rent collection was a financial problem, financial problem and sometimes a bad harvest and the low prices made a payment due, uh, of dues difficult for riots, yes. So when they were collecting the tax, some people refused to pay the tax, which means uh, they got uh, bad harvest in their year, as well as the low, pr low prices for their uh, agricultural production and everything, so that they were not in the position to pay the taxes to the zamindars as well as the collectors, so, okay? So at the time, riots deliberately uh, delayed payment, reached riots on the village hitmen and the Jodidas and the Mandals. Jodidar and the Mandals are the rich peasants in the village, right? Rich peasants in the village and they were equal to Zamindar, right? Uh, they were not only the rich peasants, but also the money lenders to the uh, poor peasants, right? Were only too happy to see Zamindars in trouble. So initially we told that the lands will be auctioned by only by the Zamindars, but whenever you see Jodidas and the Mandals are have more power in their village, which means they used to settle in the village as well as they used to uh, lend their money for the local and the poor peasants. So they have a plenty of money as well as they will uh, happily. So immediately whenever the Zamindars in trouble, the people will be happy. The Zamindars could uh, therefore not easily assert his uh, power over them. Zamindars could uh, prosecu prosecute prosecute uh, defaulters, but the judicial process was long drawn. In Bourbon alone, alone there was over 30,000, right? 30,000 pending suits for arrears of rent payment in 1798. So, no in the city of uh, Bourbon, there are Bourbon alone. In the one city, there are 30,000 pending suits. I mean, 30,000 people, uh, pending uh, people, wa uh, people wanted to pay the taxes to the company in 
so the rise of jodidars right so previously we discussed about the jodidars a group of rich peasants as well as the money lender in the village so whenever the jamidars were in the crisis their people are enjoying lots and lots why see while many zamindars were facing the crisis at the end of the 18th century a group of rich peasants were consolidating their position in the village so in the late end of the 18th century 18th century what happened many zamindars are facing the economic crisis okay facing the problem of economic crisis at the same time a group of rich peasants are uh, consolidating consolidating their position in the same village so according to the french uh, francis uh, bunchan and surveys of the dinaj uh, dinajpur district in north bengal what he is telling about the people of jodida is nothing but the description of the class is uh, rich peasants known as jodidars yes so here francis benchman's survey is telling about the rich peasants is known as jodidars by early 19th century jodidars occupied a vast areas of land so you know down in the late of 19th century jodidars occupied a vast areas of land sometimes they uh, started uh, accessing more than 1000 acres okay started accessing more than 1000 acres they are not only the controller of local trade as also they are lending money to the local peasants and they exercising immense power over the poorer cultivators of the region so as i told you they are not only the purchaser of the land when the zamindars were in crisis but also they are lending the money to local uh, poor poor peasants as well as they are the immense great immense power of the poor cultivators right so a large part of their land was cultivated through the shop uh, share croppers uh, who brought their own plough for labor in the field and handed uh, over half to produce the jodidars after the harvest so most probably a part of the land was cultivated part of jodidars land was cultivated by the uh, share croppers share croppers is nothing but the people uh, who will share their crops once it cultivated right so uh, when the villages the power of jodidars was more effective than the zamindars so you you know that uh, within the village the jodidars have plenty of power than the zamindars why initially these zamindars used to live in the urban areas so they cannot concentrate on the uh, as well as they cannot understand the lifestyle of the people in the village but jodidars used to locate in the villages so that easily they could control over the people in the poor villages so they fiercely resisted efforts by zamindars to increase the uh, jama of the village uh, jama of the village and they prevented zamindari officials from executing their duties mobilizing royards who were dependent on them and uh, deliberately delayed payment of revenue to the zamindars in fact when the estates of the zamindars were auctioned for a failure to make uh, make revenue payment uh, jodidars were often amongst the purchases so you know that whenever the zamindars were in the economic crisis and whenever the company seized the lands of zamindars so immediately the next purchaser of the zamindars land will be jodidars right will be jodidars so here we know that jodidars has a much power in within a village right so jodidars were most powerful in the north bengal although rich peasants and the village headmen were emerging the commanding figures in the countryside in the other parts of bengal as well in some places they were called holodars so in some places they were called as holodars and in some places they were called as uh, gandidars and mandals they rise invariably weakened the zamindars authority so one side when the whenever the zamindars were in economic crisis and another side these jodidars took their opportunities advantage and they started to improve their lifestyle by purchasing the Uh, lands which has been auctioned in the public place right so next one is the system the tax system of the company so you know the company who were the owners of the land right company is the owner of the land so this company will be auctioned to the zamindar you know this company is uh, auctioned the land to the zamindars from zamindars royards okay from zamindars royards royards used to get the land from this zamindar for a rent right then from royards under royards used to get the uh, land for rent from royards so now under royard want to pay tax to the royard and the royard want to pay tax to the zamindar and the zamindar want to pay tax to the company right so this is one process and next one is jodidars here uh, jodidars is the people who is uh, getting land from the zamindar right who is getting land from the zamindars also they are 
lending money to the royards, right? They are lending money to royards. Uh, once they uh, harvested their crops, the crop should be sell to royards, okay? And from the royards, the royards they will pay tax to the zamindar. Then under royards, under jodidars, right? Under royards will be there under jodidars. These under uh, royards will be pay tax to the jodidar. Jodidar will pay tax to the zamindar. But however it is, they are the rich people. I mean uh, owners. I mean uh, actioning their land from them. Jodidar, Jodidar are the group of people who will get the land from the zamindar, and from them, royals used to get the land as well as the money. Okay, so this is the company cycle. I mean the taxes cycle. You know, zamindars were the responsible for paying revenue to the company, uh, distributing the revenue demand over village. So here, zamindars were the people who is responsible to pay tax to the company as well as distributing the land to the village people. Then each village royards, big or small, paid rent to the zamindar. So each royards in the village who is uh, cultivating the land are responsible to responsible to pay tax to the zamindar. Then jodidars gave out the loan to the royards and sold their produce. So here jodidars is giving money to, I mean, uh, uh, lending money, right? Uh, giving loan to the royards and uh, getting their crops, right? Royards cultivating the some lands and gave out to rest of the under royards on rent. So here, how under royards? What is the under royards is nothing but the cultivating land more than they cultivated, the extra lands will be given to the under royards. So the under royards used to cultivate in the extra land even though they want to pay tax to the royards. Under royards pay rent to the royards. Okay, so from zamindar royards were getting, from royards under royards were getting. So here from zamindars jodidars were getting, then from jodidars both royards and under royards were getting the land so this is a tax cycle of company right so the next thing is about the zamindars resist so previously we discussed that in the end of 18th century uh, the zodidars are taking much advantage against the zamindars so here in the place of uh, zodidars here zamindars wanted to rule i mean consolidate power strongly than the zodidars so they took some um, manwares okay they took some manwares ideas as well as tricks to uh, hand over the lands from the rajas right so the authority of the zamindars in rural areas, however, did not collapse. So previously we discussed that most probably the government, I mean the company had seized over all the lands of zamindars due to the uh, due to the failing of paying uh, taxes and everything. But they did not collapse uh, fully, especially in the rural areas. So faced with an ex exorbitantly high revenue demand and the possible actions to their estates, they devised a ways for surprise. Uh, super, uh, surviving the pressures a uh, new contest produce new strategies so here they took a uh, new ideas as well as a uh, new ways for uh, surviving and uh, under the pressure of the company as well as the uh, paying taxes to uh, company regularly and etc so here what are the things and the, what are the ways they have taken for uh, maintaining their lands as their wish is nothing but so the fictitious sale was one such stra strategy. So not on fictitious sale. So previously we discussed that 90 percentage of the sale or the fictitious one in the uh, public place, right? I mean in the auction, 90 percentage of the auction were the fictitious. Remaining five will be uh, purchased by some other merchants. So here the fictitious la sale was one such strategy, and it involves a series of uh, man wars, right? So I'll, uh, I already told you that they took some a new series of uh, man wars, right, uh, for uh, withholding their lands by themselves. The Raja of uh, Bodhwan, for instance, first formed some, uh, first transferred some of his zamindar to his uh, mother. So here, the first thing is second by the Raja of uh, Bodhwan. So what he did is nothing but he hand over his all the zamindar he took his under the control of his uh, mother. Why he hand it over to under the control of his mother is nothing but previously the company fixed the rule that that what the property of a woman would not be taken over. So the woman whoever is uh, holding their property and uh, these property of the woman will not be taken over even if they fail to uh, pay the taxes to the company. So that's what here the Maharaja of uh, Bodhwan have uh, transferred all his zamindaris to his mother. Then next thing is the second move is nothing but his agents manipulated the action. So next thing is his agents, whose agents? Here the Rajas or the Rajas and the Zamindari agents manipulated the action, which means 
the agents used to purchase the land from the company and uh, which means they will put their investment and they will cut uh, get the land from the uh, company and uh, after that what happened if they did not pay the money to the company i mean tax to the company again the company will seize the land again they will auction again next is zamindari uh, agent will purchase the land again they will not pay the tax again they will seize the land but finally these lands will be what will be sold to low prices to the zamindar okay sold at the low prices to the zamindar so finally the zamindar is never paid the full revenue demand the company rarely uh, recovered the unpaid balances that had piled up right so here as i told you that this circle first one is the rajas were uh, handed over all their zamindaris under their mother control why they hand it over to their mother is nothing but the company previously fixed that the property of women would not be taken over that's the first thing next thing is that the agents of rajas were manipulated the action which means they fixed the agents like a brokers no first they will purchase the land and see zamindar's been brought the property outbidding other purchases subsequently they refused to pay the pay up the purchase money yes first they will get the money sorry get the land and next thing is they refuse to pay the tax again the land will be seized over and again it will be purchased by next is zamindar's agent and again they will fail to pay money and again uh, this process okay so this process will finally endlessly happen so finally the company started to sell their land at low price to the zamindars so here uh, many uh, revenues want to come to the company so however it is rarely they recover okay rarely means uh, it's very difficult to recover the uh, taxes from the people so such transactions happened on a great sale between 1793 to 181 uh, four big zamindars of bengal including bodwan and binami purchases that collectively yield as much as 30 lakh and of the total sale at the auction over 50 15% was fictitious right so in this such transaction had happened between 1793 1800 sorry 1801 so there are four big zamindars in bengal who were made their binami so you know the binami unnamed properties right uh, they made their binami purchases and uh, finally 30 lakhs they however they totally collectively they yield as much as 30 lakhs and in this out of the sale of the auction 15 percentage were fictitious right so there were another ways in which zamindars uh, circumvented displacement when people from outside the zamindars brought on estates on the auction at an action they could not always take take position at times their agents would be attacked by uh, lotyols of the former zamindars yes so here if any person uh, purchase the land apart from the particular village or particular area they will be attacked by this lotyols so lotyols is nothing but the person who is very strong as well as who know to handle a lathi uh, that is stick is there no so the lathi so these uh, lotyols were arranged by the local as well as the former zamindars and they used to tempt these lotyols to uh, attack the other purchasers right sometimes even the royards uh, resisted uh, royards resisted the entry of the outsiders and they failed to bond to their own zamindar through the sense of loyalty and uh, perceived him a figure of authority and themselves uh, as his uh, praja which means a subject the sale of zamindars disturbed their sense of identity their pride and the zamindars uh, therefore were not easily displaced so some people i mean some royards if any royards brought their land from i mean auctioned their land from outside the village or outside the area or cities is nothing but they used to tie up with the local zamindars and they used to get money for as a loan and uh, they have some connection with them and they will be under them through uh, to their loyalty and etc by the long by the beginning of the 19th century the depression in the depression in the prices was over thus those who had survived the trouble in 1790s consolidated their power ruling of revenue payment were also made somewhat of flexible as a result the zamindar's power over the village was strengthened it was only during the great depression in um, 1930 that they were finally collapsed and the jodidars consolidated their power in the country said yes so in the late 19th century right in the late 19th century what happened 
their crops started uh, cultivating uh, the crops were uh, harvested nicely and the people uh, enjoyed a uh, lots and lots and that time the revenue payment was also regular to the company and as well as it was a uh, flexible so as a result again the zamindars are uh, consolidated their power in a strong manner and it it happened and only till 1930 but after 1930 again their uh, rule rule i mean their again their uh, uh, what power was collapsed and again jyotidas consolidated their power over the countryside right so after the many changes uh, in the uh, land revenue system and the permanent settlement and the tax collection and everything finally the fifth report was submitted by the company officials to the company and as well as in the england parliament and this made a big issues in the parliament right so many changes uh, uh, we were we are discussing were documented in the details in the reports that were submitted to the british parliament in 1813 so many changes had happened in the land revenue as i told you the land revenue and the revenue collection and the zamindaris and the collectorate and the districts everything had happened every changes had happened and this uh, report was submitted right this report was uh, submitted uh, to the british parliament in 18 13 so it was the fifth of the series of the reports of administration and the activities of east india company in india so it was the fifth report of the east india company which they made on the administration activities of the company so this uh, report has uh, ran up to right this report uh, this fifth report ran up to 1002 pages right 1002 pages in this out of 1002 pages 800 pages were uh, i mean uh, merged with a uh, petition of the zamindars and royals right merged uh, appendix is nothing but merged merged with the petitions of zamindars the zamindars as well as the royals right so as well as the reports of the collectors from the different districts so statistical tables on the revenue and the notes revenue and the judicial administration of bengal and the madras were written above Uh, officially so after the report of uh, fifth re- after the fifth report again the special bengal and the madras administration as well as the judicial administration were written up separately so from the time company established the rule in bengal in uh, mid 1760 not on so after the fifth report again the company established their new rule in 1760 for what to closely watch the debate in england so this rule actually they set up for uh, maintain to as well as to regulate the system land system in india so here uh, there were uh, many groups in britain who were opposed to the monopoly in the east india company east india company had over trade with the china and india these groups wanted the recovery of the loyal charter and gave the company this monopoly so some official british officials in the parliament they thought that the east india company have a tra- often trade with india and china so in this the company india only is the developing so apart from this england is not anyway going to develop uh i mean under the influence of india so many officials did not like that india is developing so an increasing number of the private traders wanted to share in the indian trade and the industries of britain were keen to uh open up the indian markets for british manufacturers so the first thing is that what the people are telling now uh, the uh, many private merchants uh, i mean the many private traders are growing in india and they are asking the share of the indian trade to china that's the first thing and the next thing is that the britain were taking uh, measure i mean taking uh, measures to establish the market open markets in india for not indian okay for british manufacturers right so many political groups argued that the conquest of bengal were benefiting only the east india company but not the britain nation as whole so many british officials finally they are uh, telling the i mean uh, they are uh, i mean criticizing the com- criticizing the government that only east india company is uh, developing in india but the british nation is not going to develop in any more by inter- by trading with india and uh, uh, taking measures to open the indian markets for european manufacturer information about the company misrul and the mal administration was hotly debated in the britain and incidents of the greed and the corruption in many com- uh, sorry corruption in company officials were widely published in the press so as well as the many news informations about the east india company also published in the press is nothing but the first one is many british officials are uh, corrupting 
okay uh, many british officials are greed and a corruption they are making in the east india company and these news were being published in the uh, newspapers and the press everywhere the british parliament uh, passed the serious acts in the late 18th century to regulate the control of the company in india so after this debate in the parliament and the news published in the media then finally the british parliament established a new act in late 18th century to control to regulate and control the company role in india and it forced the company to produce the regular reports on the administration of india and appointed committees to inquire into the affairs of the company so after the establishment of the regulating act right regulating uh, act the act what the act is telling that periodically the committee which they have which was appointed by the company want to submit the administration report of india as well as the east india company fifth rule uh, fifth report was uh, one such report produced with the select committee it becomes the basics of in, uh, intents of parliament debates and the nature of the east india company rule in india so the finally the fifth report made a big debate in the british parliament as well as it creates uh, the nature of east india company rule in india then over the century of the half uh, over the century and a half and uh, first uh, fifth report had shaped our conception of what happened in a rural bengal in the late 18th century evidence contained the fifth report is a uh, valuable so after that what had happened what are the problems had happened in the late 18th century especially in bengal and this fifth report submitted with a uh, full of evidence as well as these evidence are very valuable but the officials reports like this have to be read carefully we know we need to know who wrote these reports and why they were written in fact recent researches show that arguments and evidence offered by the fifth report cannot be accepted and critically so here we want to know that who had written the report and what was their purpose to write this report and some new researchers and the scholars are telling that this won't be accepted in the present days right so here researchers have carefully examined the archives in the archives in the various uh, bengal uh, zamindars and the local records in the districts where right right about the history of the colonial rule in bengal they indicate that the intent and the criticizing the mal administration of the company the fifth report extra gener extra generate the collapse of the trading traditional zamindari power as also overestimated overestimated the scale on which zamindars were losing their land so due to the mal administration so previously we have discussed that mal administration is nothing but the corruption and the greed so many british officials are involved with the mal administration so the impact of the mal administration is nothing but the fifth report exaggerate the nuisances of uh, zamindari power which means they have totally lost their uh, power i mean uh, zamindaris were totally lost their power also they were underestimated by the company and they are losing their lands and everything as we have seen even when zamindars were actioned zamindars were not always uh, displaced given the igneous method they used to retain the, uh, retain their zamindar so you know that the company is uh, uh, i mean the company ran only with their profits only the aim of the profits once the zamindar is lost uh, lost their land and when it's action the company did not give any resolution to the zamindars for uh, i mean withholding their lands instead they were enjoying by actioning their lands right yes the regulating act of uh, 1773 right so in this regulating act what are the changes made by the company into the uh, indian subcontinent as well as what are the changes they did in the company and as well as what are the reason behind this act of uh, 1773 that we are going to discuss in this thing right yes so here the reason behind 1773 act the first one is territorial expansion so here the british wanted to expand their territory so previously we discussed that first they introduced a territorial uh, company only in bengal so here they wanted to expand all over the subcontinent so that was the first reason and the next thing is corruption amongst the servants of company so after the discussion with the british parliament the uh, many news is like uh, the british officials were very greed and the corruption and these news is were published in uh, media and everywhere so the corruption amongst the servants of company that the company wanted to uh, what abolish the corruption 
then next thing is lack of proper judicial administration so there is no such provision uh, proper record which was uh, followed by the british officials i mean the company officials the next one is lack of proper central authority so here the lack of central proper authority is nothing but they didn't maintain anything like a uh, zamindaris were lost their power and they didn't give any uh, things i mean uh, hints to develop their uh, bus, uh, i mean uh, land system and the service and etc then deteriorating financial condition of the company so the financial condition was totally destroyed in the company so finally what happened company was uh, defeated in 1769 by the hands of either hali so in fact in the great famine had happened in bengal in 1770 right great famine had happened in bengal in 1770 so finally company was very uh, poor in the economic crisis and they started asking loan for 1 million pounds in 1772 to the british people right so finally uh, the company was very poor in the economic crisis so they started uh, applying for loan of 1 million pounds in 1772 to the british country right yes so next one is changes now we are going to discuss that what are the changes made by the uh, regulating act 1773 so this was the first step by the british government to control over the co- control as well as to regulate the company as well as the land revenue system and etc the next thing is it designed the governor of bengal as the governor general of bengal it is important so it designed the uh, post of uh, governor of bengal into the governor general of bengal so as per this act the first governor general of bengal was lord warren hasting right so the next thing is the subordinated the governor of bombay and madras to the governor general of bengal so here the governor of bombay and madras will be under the uh, governor general of bengal and the supreme court was established at williams fort in calcutta in 1774 now done so new supreme court was established in calcutta calcutta 1774 and after that this court comprising one chief judge and three remain other judges now done so first supreme court was established in calcutta at william uh williams fort williams in 1774 and this court comprising one chief judge and other three judges so as per this new act the new judge chief judge was sir eliza impe right sir eliza impe was the first chief justice of the supreme court right 